welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's Institute Forum Talk. We're very excited to host um, Dr. Alice cronin Golome here. Um, Dr. cronin Golome is Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences and Director of the Vision and Cognition Laboratory at Boston University, or BU. She's also faculty in BU's Interdisciplinary Center for Systems Neuroscience and Neurophotonic Center and is co-director of the Center of Clinical Biopsychology. Dr. cronin Golome obtained her bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University and her PhD in psychobiology from Caltech. She joined BU in 1989 after postdoctoral training at MIT. She currently mentors students in both clinical and experimental neuropsychology and teaches neuropsychology courses at the undergraduate and graduate level. Her principal research focus is on perception, cognition, motor function, mood, sleep, and other aspects of daily function in aging and age-related neurodegenerative disease. She employs uh, behavioral methodologies primarily, and include, which include sensory, cognitive neuroscience, neuropsychological assessment, neuroimaging, and visual psychophysics. A primary emphasis is on the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, and their interaction with motor symptoms. Her lab also engages in some interventional research to enhance quality of life. She has a long-standing interest in perception, cognition, Alzheimer's disease, and actively co collaborates on projects in this area in collaboration with Mass General. Um, her work is interdisciplinary and she's collaborated with departments as diverse as neurorehabilitation and biomedical engineering. In 2021 alone, her lab published seven manuscripts on Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and healthy adults on topics ranging from, get ready for it, retinal imaging in familial AD to visual hallucinations in PD to cognitive behavioral therapy for depression in PD, to smartphone assessment of cognition in PD, and to teleneuropsychology and smartphone sleep assessments in healthy adults, in addition to a review of the use of functional near-infrared spectroscopy to assess everyday function. Her work and that of students is supported by the NIH, the American Parkinson's Disease Association, the Swiss National Science Foundation, the BU Alzheimer's Disease Initiative, and the Boston Uni University Digital Health Initiative. Some recent news on Dr. cronin Golom. She spent a portion of last year on sabbatical in Switzerland, um, collaborating with Olaf Blanc on visual perception and hallucinations. This work was supported by the Swiss National Foundation. Um, and when I, and most notably, when I asked her to comment on her most recent accomplishment, she remarked that she feels most accomplished about getting her students through the past year. Um, I can, I have not met Dr. cronin Golom until today in person, but I have worked with many of her students. I have been supervised by her students. I was texting with one of them just before this call who described her as her science superhero. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to mention that because good mentorship should never go unappreciated. Um, so uh, with that, I will introduce Dr. cronin Golom, uh, who will be speaking to us about visual perception and cognition in Parkinson's disease. Hey, thank you so much, Umesh. That's a lovely introduction. And I immediately was reaching for my mute button because that's what I do on Zoom calls. Uh, but I thought, oh, maybe not today. Maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. And, and in regarding my, my former students, um, may I just say that it is such a pleasure to work with brilliant, wonderful uh, students uh, who then go on to be brilliant, wonderful clinicians and researchers. And the work I'm talking about today, as you'll see, uh, relies so much on them. Uh, thank you for having me here. I also, I want to especially thank the more junior members of uh, your research group here, um, especially those with young children. I don't know how you're doing it these days. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, people do know to some extent what you're going through. Um, and for students as well, it, it, we keep pretending things are normal and they are nowhere near normal. And I think we have to really be aware of that and be willing to um, help uh, our junior faculty and our students to a very large extent these days. This is going to, the effects of this are going to go on for years, obviously. Okay, with all that said, let me get to uh, some of the things that we're doing in science. I'm going to be talking about vision, perception, and cognition in relation to walking in Parkinson's disease today. Um, as Umesh said, I am uh, also, I have a long history of doing work in Alzheimer's disease and normal aging. Um, and I work sometimes uh, with people working with other conditions like HIV and some others. So I'm happy to talk about other disorders as well if people are interested in that. But just starting with this. 
Um, okay, so I just need to figure out how to advance my slides. Here we go. Uh, so I'm going to break this up into three parts of the talk. First, talking about vision, specifically spatial frequency contrast sensitivity in relation to um, cognition and perception in PD. Um, second, I'm going to go on to perception, uh, specifically biological motion perception in relation to vision and walking. And then third, I'll go to visual attention and motor function um, with attention training to improve walking. Okay. All right, so starting with vision, um, contrast sensitivity. Uh, it just means sort of the difference between an object and its background, the sharpness of the difference between an object and its background. It's not exactly the same as acuity. Um, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But anyway, um, I'm going to be focusing on the spatial part, contrast sensitivity, and its relation to cognition and specifically object identification or object recognition, and in relation to perception, and that is specifically uh, visual hallucinations. Okay, so here's the picture so that you know vaguely what I'm talking about. Um, so you'll see on the left of each of those pairs of pictures, uh, you have uh, what looks like a Snell and Acuity chart, like you would have had at the eye doctor's office. And you just read the letters down and they tell you what your acuity is, okay? Um, what's happening from the top ones to the bottom ones is I've reduced contrast sensitivity, okay? So you can still read the letters because letters are high spatial frequencies but it's harder to make out things going on in the more complex figure on the right. You probably um, might've even missed if you just started with the bottom pictures that there's actually a person next to the car in that, in that image. Uh, so contrast sensitivity is, it will affect high frequencies, but also lower frequencies where lower frequencies are more important for things like face recognition. Okay. So people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and various, various other disorders, have a low contrast sensitivity and what that means for them functionally it can mean quite a number of things. You can have problems with object recognition. I have a list here. You have problems with spatial navigation, your environment. Bumping into doorways, we uh, hear of that with people with PD. Uh, participating in everyday activities. And then this uh, contrast sensitivity uh, we know is also associated with uh, visual hallucinations in people with PD and dementia, all right? Um, so here's some things that we already know about contrast sensitivity. Now, don't worry, I'm gonna show you a test of contrast sensitivity in case you're unclear still of what I'm talking about. But what we've done in the past is that we've enhanced contrast, all right? So we, if we know that somebody has some poor co contrast sensitivity, we can enhance the contrast between an object and its background and then ask, can they identify it now? And the answer in uh, Parkinson's disease is yes, this is PD without dementia. And we were not at that time screening for visual hallucinations. So a regular sample of non-demented people with PD um, had some problems with object identification, but if we crank up the contrast, the differences, uh, group differences disappear. Okay, so we've done that with letter identification. We've done it with a digit, digit cancellation task as well. So we've shown that in Parkinson's relative to age-matched older adults, and we've shown it in older adults relative to younger adults as well. So um, we had a paper on vision fair neuropsychological testing. Um, you know, for those of you doing neuropsychology, uh, sometimes under ideal, not less than ideal visual conditions, uh, sometimes they can't really see what they're doing on the tests that well, and you're calling that a cognitive impairment when it could be a visual impairment. Okay, so we know about that. We also know that people with PD, uh, that's the abbreviation we use P with PD, with visual hallucinations and dementia have impaired contrast sensitivity, as I said. So, so we already know that. What we don't know, um, oops, here we go. Here we go. The question motivating the first study, what we don't know is um, if we enhance contrast sensitivity to improve object identification in, P in PD, will that work with people with visual hallucinations? Never looked at it. Will it work with people with visual hallucinations who do not have dementia? So some of the novel aspects of this study is the focus on people with PD with visual hallucinations without dementia specifically, and 
um, our attempt to improve contrast sensitivity um, in people with PD or improve object identification because of changing contrast uh, in people with visual hallucinations. All right, so study one was led by my former doctoral student, Mireya Diaz Santos, who is now at UCLA. Um, and the name of the paper that I'm drawing from here that came out last year is Increasing Contrast Improves Object Perception in Parkinson's Disease Without with Visual Hallucinations. So I guess I could stop there because that tells you all the results, but in the hope that maybe you wanna know more about it, I'm gonna uh, give you a little more detail. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, 13 uh, people with PD with visual hallucinations and 13 without visual hallucinations called NVH. Now, why is the sample so small? The sample is small because it is very difficult to find people with visual hallucinations who are also not demented, okay? So usually when you find people with visual hallucinations in PD, they are already farther along in the disease course and they have cognitive impairment, right? So it's, you don't know what to make of that when you're, working with somebody with dementia, there can be so many reasons why they're not performing well in a certain task, cognitive reasons why they're not performing well. And that's why Maria wanted to look at this in people without dementia. So the approach was this, we had a lot of different studies going on in our lab at the time, uh, where we're bringing in people, non-demented people with PD. And so she said, well, how about if I just ask them about hallucinations, give them five items from the test, ask them if they endorse any hallucinations. And if they do, I'll ask them to then do my contrast sensitivity study. So we're like, yeah, that's fine. It took forever to get 13 participants because the people who are referred for our studies aren't demented. They're being referred by our movement disorders group at the medical center uh, who knew that we were looking for people without dementia for our studies. Uh, most of our studies were on cognition and mood and so and perception. and. And so we got very few people coming in who endorsed any visual hallucinations. So it took quite a long time to collect uh, these data, but managed to get 13 of them. Obviously we had a much larger sample of people without visual hallucinations. Um, and what Mireya did was um, go through those and select out those who matched the ones with visual hallucinations uh, very, very well. So um, if you, don't know too much about PD, we have uh, certain ways of uh, looking at the scores of their motor severity. Um, so we have the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, UPDRS, and from that you can pull out a, a rough stage of impairment called the Honin yar So the range is one, meaning um, unilateral involvement, very mild, up to three, which is moderate bilateral impairment, okay? So, and that's our usual range in our studies, one to three, home in year. Uh, the two Parkinson's groups with and without visual hallucinations were matched on all of these variables, age education. There were seven males and six females uh, in each group. They were matched for visual acuity for many mental state. So overall cognitive global cognition. Uh, they were matched on the Beck depression inventory. Uh, the UPDRS I've already mentioned for disease severity also disease duration. And then they were matched for the kinds of Parkinsonian medications they were taking, the extent of it called the levodopa equivalent dose. Okay. Um, of this group of 13, um, these are different types of hallucinations. So six of them had complex hallucinations, also known as formed hallucinations, which is what we often see in PD. Um, usually when patients report to us, they tell us that they're seeing animals or they're seeing people where there are none. You know, especially at dusk, they're driving, they see somebody on the side of the road, for example. So uh, there was one person who only had that kind of hallucination, but those are usually the last ones to come. So if you see somebody with complex hallucinations, they often have some of the other ones as well. A simple hallucination is just maybe seeing lights flashing or lines. Um, a passage hallucination is the feeling that something just went by you. And then finally, uh, presence hallucinations um, are uh, the feeling that somebody is there in the room with you. So that doesn't feel visual, but those are often uh, the ones that start. And then later on, people get the other visual hallucinations. The fifth kind of hallucination is actually illusions. That is when you see some, something 
um, and you misconstrue it as something else visually. Okay. All right, so finally, getting to the actual contrast sensitivity test. Uh, it's a very simple task. It was originally designed uh, for us to collect data from Alzheimer's patients. Um, and it's just identify the masked letter. And there are four letters, H, O, T, and X. And it's a staircase procedure, which is a standard of use in psychophysical uh, studies that you have um, the letter comes up and then an interstimulus interview interval that's very brief and then a mask which is shown here I don't know if, can you see my I don't know if you can see my cursor see my little arrow okay so that's the mask and then they just respond verbally and say what letter they saw and um, and so it's the difference what we're manipulating is the difference between the letter that comes up and the the grayness of the background okay so that's the contrast between the letter and the background and we're going to reduce that difference. Uh, as, as people are doing well, we reduce it because we're trying to get everybody to 80% target identification, right? So regardless of where you start and how impaired your contrast sensitivity is, we're going to move this along until you get 80% correct. And then the question is, how much did you need? How much did we have to increase the contrast for you to get to that level? Okay, does that, people are pretty clear on that, I hope. Okay, you can always put questions into the chat if, if you like. Um, and here are the results. So what I want you to look at first is here on the left, this is the overall sample. So the amount of contrast that the sample overall needed between the background and the uh, letter was 44%, uh, I think it was there. Um, and that accords quite well with um, previous studies that we've done in PD, something in the 40s percent Nicholson contrast. When you break it up into the people with visual hallucinations and the people without visual hallucinations, you see the difference. There's a significant difference there. So the people with visual hallucinations needed more contrast to get to that 80% criterion. Okay, so they needed on average 53%. Whereas the people without hallucinations needed only 35%. Okay. We are able to get them to that level. We are able to match them for accuracy. Um, when you looked a little further uh, within this visual hallucinations group, even though there are only 13 of them, so I don't want to make a big deal of this, um, it was really driven by the people with the complex hallucinations. Um, just that group of six needed 61% contrast. Okay. So what we're saying here uh, for the summary is that in PD without dementia, people who have visual hallucinations have poorer contrast sensitivity than people with hallucinations. Um, the hallucinations group benefited from contrast enhancement just as others do, and that brought them up to the same level of accuracy in being able to identify the letters as the group without visual hallucinations, okay? Um, as I said, it seems to be the, the ones with the complex hallucinations. So the ones probably, that, that's the most difficult group. Um, you know, you don't start with the complex and then get the milder sorts, the minor hallucinations. That's a major hallucination. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting was um, once we took that group out, the, the, the hallucinations group, if you were just looking at people without hallucinations, that is, we asked them, do you have hallucinations? And they said, no, um, they only need 35% contrast. Whereas with our other samples, when we never asked about it, they needed it in the 40s. So probably we had people in our samples right along who may have had contrast, may have had a history of hallucinations. We don't know. Okay, so that's the first study. So that's uh, the Dia Santos study on visual hallucinations. And we're still very interested in hallucinations and we're gonna be using some of this information going forward, which I'll get to at the end when I tell you some of the things coming up. The second- Can um, I ask a quick question yes, before certainly. you go into study? Certainly. Uh, thanks. Uh, is this, so is this uh, due to retinal pathology? Is it something more related to basal ganglia? What, 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 where, no, it's- just a, Right, right. So it's not retinal because, uh, well, it, unless it's so subtle that we aren't picking it up, because we actually, uh, it, with a lot of our studies, we had done full neuro ophthalmological examinations. 
on our patients. I'm, I'm not sure if I actually said that or not, but um, so they went to a neuro ophthalmologist. Um, they had the full retinal exam. Yeah, at the bottom here. So we want to exclude anything like that so that it's clearly not that that's going on there. If you look at the literature on hallucinations, um, you know, you get all sorts of cortical involvement in hallucinations. Contrast sensitivity, we also see it with groups with cortical lesions, but it can really be anywhere along the visual pathway. Um, so we're not sure in these cases where that's coming from, but it certainly doesn't look ocular and it doesn't look retinal. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I can't go. <laughs> I can't tell you more than that. We didn't have any scanning on. Could I ask a quick follow-up to that? Sure. Um, I was wondering how much of this is um, just sort of a an uncertainty question about, you know, if people have these visual hallucinations, maybe they just need more contrast to be certain that it's not a hallucination before they're willing to report it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. They, um, so, you know, the questionnaire that we gave people just said, do you ever have these things happen, right? And so this group of 13 endorsed that, right? They said, yeah, we've had this happen. I've seen this uh, many times in support group meetings when I ask about hallucinations and you know nobody raises their hand. There's a lot of stigma, right, attached to this. And, uh, and they don't. And it just takes one brave soul in a support group to say, yeah, sometimes I have a little this. And then everybody else perks up, right? I think it's quite common in PD that people have this. Um, it, you have to know how to ask. Sometimes the word hallucination is, is um, fraught with meaning for a lot of people. Uh, they think about schizophrenia, for one thing. And uh, we like to use the term unusual perceptual experiences when we're asking people about this now. Um, say, for example, and then we can give some examples of it. Um, the literature, of course, uses the term hallucinations. Which is even exactly right because a lot of what people do is have illusions. They they misconstrue something visually. Right. Mis I was going to say misperception might the be misperception. Uh, so we would call that a minor uh, hallucination. We call it an illusion. But it, I mean, strictly speaking, it shouldn't even be classified there, right? Because usually when you think of hallucinations, you're thinking of things that appear out thin air, right? That um, that nobody else is seeing. So. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, you know, we always have that issue with patient groups as well as with healthy older adults is about the confidence. Um, and so you just try to build in controls for your various tests to make sure that that's not what's driving it. That's a good question. Yep, thanks. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go on to perception now, and this will be um, biological motion perception in relation to vision. Now you're all experts on contrast sensitivity. You know what I'm talking about. And other types of motion perception I'll bring up as well. And then walking. And uh, we talk about percep perception action coupling. Sometimes this advances and sometimes it doesn't. There we go. So what do we mean by biological motion perception? All this means is human motion perception, all right? you may argue with that. You may say, well, you know, there are other things that are biological besides humans, but in the field, when we say biological motion, it means human, not animals, not non-human animals, nothing else. Um, we derive a lot of information from the movement of other humans. We can tell things about their actions, obviously, but about emotions, about intentions, about personality traits, all kinds of things. So biological motion is related more than other kinds of vision to a certain extent uh, to the more social aspects of being, okay? So if somebody has problems with emotion recognition, uh, with theory of mind, with other aspects of social cognition, uh, which have been documented in Parkinson's disease, you know, this could be um, somehow tied to, uh, you know, at the same time, biological motion perception, not necessarily that one is causing the other, but they may be coming from the same place. Um, possible functional consequences are things like interpersonal difficulties and misinterpretation of social cues. And we're also very interested in the translation to one's own motion. So in Parkinson's, it's, what it's characterized by 
is dysfunctional gait and posture. Um, when we think about perception, action, coupling, uh, the kinds of things that we're thinking about are, if you have poor motor function, do you see poor motor, motor function in other people? Can you not even recognize normal function, right? And this may be bi-directional. So some potential mechanisms of impaired biological motion perception, first of all, low level vision, right? It could just be, you can't see anything terribly well, right? That's not that interesting, but you know, it's something you have to look for. So we'd be looking at contrast sensitivity and we'd be looking at various aspects of motion, other kinds of motion perception. It could be about a slightly higher level perceptual processing that is integrating form and motion cues. So the form being the, the person, the body that you're looking at, and then how it's moving. And then if for Parkinson's specifically about motor disability. So we know that they walk slowly, they have short uh, stride length, they have increased stride frequency, giving a characteristic shuffle. And, and so all those things about the abnormal gait, you know, maybe that's influencing how they're seeing how other people move. Okay, so some of the things that we already know, we know that people with Parkinson's have impaired contrast sensitivity also problems with other aspects of vision. We know they have impaired emotion recognition. That's a former student, uh, Urena Clark, doing that work, uh, as well as other people. And others have reported problems with other aspects of social cognition, including theory of mind. And of course, they have the disordered gait and posture, other motor difficulties. OK, so some of the questions that we have here, does Parkinson's impair detection of biological motion, number one? Right. If yes, then is it related to low level vision contrast sensitivity? If yes, is there is their own impairment in perception of walking related to um, how they perceive other people walking? And a novel aspect of this study is is that nobody had done any work on biological motion perception in PD. It's a very understudied topic in general. Okay. All right. So the studies. I'm well combined study that I'll be talking about was led by my former doctoral student, Abhi Jaywant, who is now at Weill Cornell in New York. Um, he's done a lot of COVID work since coming to New York, just kind of pushed into working on the COVID unit too. Amazing what people have been able to do in the last couple of years. So a couple of his papers, impaired perception of biological motion in PD and randomized control trial of a home-based action observation intervention to improve walking in PD. So questions are, uh, does Parkinson's impair the perception of biological motion? Is it related to low level vision? Is it related to their own walking deficits? Okay, so the participants here, we have 26 people with PD, uh, non-demented and 24 matched uh, healthy control participants. They're matched on age, education, uh, acuity, mini mental, uh, the geriatric depression scale this time and the Beck in anxiety inventory. I want to point out again that we have uh, very close numbers, um, males and females with PD. Um, I do want to bring that up because most studies of PD uh, tend to have many more males than females. It's a disease that affects men more than women, probably two to one or so. Uh, but we work very hard to get women into our studies. Um, because the disease manifests differently in men and women. And so we want to make sure we're representing correctly. And, um, you know, people ask me, well, how do you get women into the studies? And I'll, I'll tell you the secret. The secret is you ask them. Um, you know, usually if you ask, you say, ladies, we don't know about this in women with PD. We need to know. And they'll say, okay, <laughs> it's, it's really not hard. <laughs> All right, so again, people, uh, mild to moderate disease stage, median hone in the R of two, range of one to three. So how do we assess biological motion uh, perception? So we use point light walkers. These have been used for decades now. Uh, you strap LEDs onto the joints of a person and uh, turn off the lights and record them walking. So you can't see anything about the, the shape of the person themselves. You, um, you're just, seeing the motion that they're doing. And that takes away worrying about all sorts of other things. And the uh, task here is uh, for the person to say if it looks like somebody walking or not, just a yes, no. And we have deep primus our measure. 
So looking at the one on the left, I'm gonna play the little movie for you. This is what it looks like. All right, so probably a lot of you have seen these before. So that would be a yes, that looks like somebody walking. The one on the right is a little more scrambly. So less looking like somebody who is walking. Uh, so uh, Abby actually went to Rutgers to record these point light walkers um, with himself being one of them. And uh, we were working with Maggie Schifrar who was at Rutgers at the time and recording both natural and Parkinsonian styles of walking, uh, three different walking speeds, and then uh, masked with extra dots to make the task more difficult versus unmasked. We also assessed um, other kinds of motion perception. So one was object motion. So it was the tractor that you'll see in a moment and then coherent motion perception. So this is uh, the point light tractor. So you can just see the little wheels turning there and does it look like a moving tractor? Um, the next one is the coherent motion. This is very low level motion task. And the question is, is the group of dots moving to the left or right? Um, and we it, make it harder and easier. It's a very standard kind of task. This goes by very, very quickly. So look carefully and you can decide whether they're moving to the left or right. And then they, they just get harder. Um, okay, so there's less coherence as we go along. So you get the idea here. I don't need to go through all of it. We also did a walking assessment. So uh, people were walking the hallway for 10 meters or 20 meters. Uh, they were wearing accelerometers um, on their ankles. Uh, they could take these home and we could record them walking at home as well. Uh, we we're recording walking speed, stride length, stride frequency, you know, prints out an actogram like this. And let's look at some of the results here. So first of all, the Parkinson group was less sensitive than the control group in detecting biological motion. So PD in blue and uh, control group in red. You knew that that effect was coming, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about this. Uh, there was a larger effect for the more difficult mask condition, right? So uh, here we go with the mask condition. So you can see the difference there. So they were just less sensitive. There was no interaction with uh, the stimulus type, so natural versus Parkinsonian. Um, and there was no difference depending on gait speed. All right, so one of the things that we thought would happen did not. Um, they were also a little bit impaired in detecting the object motion that was the tractor, but the effect size was about half of what we saw for biological motion. And it only appeared in the difficult condition, not in the easier condition. So the um, results are in the walking assessment. So first, you know, using the accelerometers, we know that they had slower walking speed, shorter stride length, all of those usual things with Parkinson's, no surprise there, but that it didn't correlate with biological motion perception, even though that was impaired. We gave them con contrast sensitivity tests, such as what I've shown you before. They were poorer than the control group on that, no surprise there but it did not correlate with biological motion perception. And then the coherent motion, which is the very basic level of motion, there was no group difference. We weren't surprised by that and no correlations. So um, the summary is that uh, we did see impaired detection of walking and biological motion, um, not related to gait or speed or their own walking difficulty. Right, so we're recording their own walking and it wasn't related to that. It wasn't correlated with low level vision, with contrast sensitivity. Uh, object motion, magnitude of effect, about half of what we saw with biological motion. And so from all of this, we're concluding that it's more likely that they're having some problems integrating form and motion cues. So it's not just motion cues, it's not just bas basic vision. Um, so it's probably an integration and that implicates superior temporal sulcus, um, which I'm not really going to go into here. I'm not going to get into any imaging things here, but we're looking at that with my colleagues at EPFL in Switzerland. Now, the third um, study that I want to mention is um, attention and motor function in PD. Before I go on to that, did anybody have any quick questions on the perception one? All right, so let's go into attention and motor function. So we know that in Parkinson's, people have poor attention measured in various different ways. 
And of course they have the problems in posture and gait. And in the posture and gait, um, really what it comes down to is loss of automaticity. So when, when people without Parkinson's are walking, we are usually not thinking about walking. The only time you're thinking about walking is for example, on an icy sidewalk where you're afraid you might fall, right? You're really paying attention. Um, we don't have to think about that. We do not have to use our limited attentional resources and apply it to what we're doing when we're walking normally. And we don't have to do it even when we're doing another task at the same time. If you have problems with attention and you've lost uh, the, the automaticity of walking, then there are a lot of functional consequences. So the slow gait, the short strides, the forward leaning posture are all associated with this problem with automaticity, which increases the risk for falls and a really reduced ability to walk while doing something else. So dual tasking, which is very important. So what we already know in PD, loss of automaticity of walking. They have to think about what they're doing as they walk. They have to pay attention to walking, right? Now, the problem is that attention is impaired in PD too, right? So they're trying to pull their attention into walking. So they're pulling it away from other things and they already have real limits on attentional abilities. So this compromise attention is being pulled away from cognitive tasks to assist with walking. So anything cognitive motor, uh, dual task, is, which is very important for daily life, um, they aren't able to do very well. Uh, some of this work was done by my former student, Rob Salazar. So you can just imagine as you're walking around and you're not thinking about walking, you're on your phone, you're uh, looking for something on the street, looking for an address, you're doing all kinds of things while you're walking. And in many rehab clinics, uh, what people have tended to do when people complain about this is to say, well, then don't do anything else. Just do your walking. Just pay attention to your walking and don't try to do something else at the same time. Yeah, that, that doesn't go very well, right? I mean, we can ask people with PD to stand up straight. Don't slouch over, you know, don't have that forward leaning stance. They can do that. We can tell them to take longer strides. They can do that, but they have to pay so much attention. They cannot maintain that. They can't maintain it. So what we're thinking about is, can we give them better attention? If we increase their attentional resources, can some of that be applied to dual tasking? Can some of that be applied um, to walking? And along those lines, cognitive training programs are going to be more popular for training cognitive impairments in PD. Um, with the kind of attention that I'm talking about, we're thinking about a sustained attention attention that has to be held for a long period. That has not been um, examined in PD. Other kinds of attention have been. Uh, but I work with Joe DeGudis at the Boston VA, and he and his colleagues have used um, attentional training for people with right hemi neglect to improve their motor function. They've done very well with that. They've used it with all sorts of other populations. So this was a promising target uh, for interventions. So. The question is, can enhancing sustained attention improve gait and motor function in people with PD? Uh, the next question may be um, a surprise, and that is, will it preferentially benefit people with left versus right Parkinson's? I think I might have inadvertently skipped the slide. There we go, the side of motor onset. So Parkinson's is quite different from other neurodegenerative diseases in that it typically begins on one side of the body, right? So when we talk about side of motor onset, we, we say LPD for those who start on the left side of the body. So that's right hemisphere pathology, right basal ganglia pathology. And RPDs are uh, right body side uh, and they have more left hemisphere pathology. Uh, now, pretty soon after the disease starts, um, it goes bilateral, all right? But that doesn't actually matter because if I know what side the disease started on, I can tell you things about somebody's likely neuropsychological profile, for example, even though they're now bi bilateral, right? So the side that started remains the lead side in many ways in cognition and perception, right? And even uh, autopsy studies will show one side of basal ganglia is more effective than the other. There's also some evidence that LPD and RPD may respond differentially to treatments. Okay, so sorry, I had that. So the question was, if we are using a task 
that's been used successfully with hemi neglect patients. Um, so we're targeting sustained attention, which is predominantly a right hemisphere function. Will the training be better for the people with LPD, for the people with, who have the, the weaker right hemisphere function? All right, we thought we might get some side of onset effects. So when we set this up, it was to look at side of onset effects as well as general. So Joe DeGudis from uh, the Boston VA is uh, the person who's been doing a lot of this work. Um, this is the paper we're working on. It's not even submitted yet. So I want to uh, call out some of my other main collaborators on this. Ali Bartholomew is my former doctoral student. Uh, Courtney All is um, research assistant with Joe and Terry Ellis, who is the queen of physical therapy and all sorts of other things uh, to do with Parkinson's disease and my longtime collaborator. So this is what this looks like. This is a real intervention study, meaning it's really hard. It's very difficult to do. We started uh, with 35 people with PD in the study. Um, we ended up over time excluding 14 of them. This is a study that takes four weeks, um, not even including the, the four, extra four week follow-up. So we ended up with a final sample of 21 and uh, that's all we're getting on this. Uh, so there's a description below of what they look like, our kind of standard Parkinson group. Uh, 12 males, nine females, nine LPD, 12 RPD. The LPD and RPD groups are matched on almost all of the things that we usually try to match groups on, uh, but they were not matched on the male-female ratio. There were many more males in the LPD group and more females in the RPD group, and that was just bad luck. You know, we were just trying to get people and that's who we ended up with, uh, of course, with all those exclusions that we had. They were also not matched for levodopa equivalent dose. Um, the LPD group was taking more medications, but they were matched on everything else. Okay, so here's baseline differences in attention. This is a sustained attention test. This is not the training test. This is a regular sustained attention task, a, a, a go, no go, con continuous performance test. Um, in blue are the LPDs. This is commission errors, uh, the y-axis. So higher bars are worse performance. And overall, the LPD group is uh, worse at making more errors at baseline than the RPD group. Okay, for, and this is sustaining for long attention. This is a 36 minute task. This is the training condition. This is called TAP at, that's been used by Joe DeGudis and his colleagues. Um, and it's looking at target versus non target discrimination. So uh, there's an in picture here of a target of a window, let's say, and you're going to see a bunch of windows, and you have to withhold your response to that one and then click on all of the others, right? So it's difficult and it gets more difficult. The better you get, the harder it makes it. So they do this for 36 minutes a day, five days a week for four weeks, all right? So it's pretty intense. Uh, and we do rate all sorts of cognitive motor assessments at pre-training, uh, immediately after the four week training and then another four weeks after that uh, for the washout period. So here's the post-training motor, what it looks like. Um, so looking here, this is change in motor scores. All right, so that line down the middle is if nothing changed from baseline uh, to immediate uh, post-test. And everything to the left of the bar is a change in motor score in UPDRS motor um, for the better. If it's to the right of the bar, it got worse. Okay, I, I'm not going to get into why they might have gotten worse, except there could be fatigue, there could be various other things. But it, it was interesting to us that um, the LPDs um, tended to get better. Many of them tended to get better. And some of them, the four at the bottom there, that was a, a clinically meaningful difference, the way it's defined in Parkinson's disease, a clinical meaningful improvement in UPDRS scales. Um, this was all accounting for their baseline motor scores. It was accounting for the LED, the levodopa equivalent dose, because it was different in the two groups. That did not matter. There was no difference based on sex. Also, that was the other place where we had differences between the two groups. All right. Um, at the extra four-week follow-up after washout, 
Uh, we lost a few people on the way. We then had 17. There was still a trend for an interaction between the motor change and the side of the onset, okay? If you collapsed the LPD and RPD subgroups, there was no improvement in performance. So that, that's actually an important point, let's say. Can I ask a question about this? Sure. Just to be clear, I understand. So um, the people who started worse on the on the uh, training task yep. showed the bigger, tended to show the Correct. bigger improvements and yep. vice versa. Yep. So are you sure that you're not getting into ceiling, ceiling and floor not. effects? Not kind of so task. no, there's no ceiling on it. We, we they kept getting harder. On, now, throughout the LPD group, even as they were getting better, they were still worse than the RPD group, but the RPD still had a lot of room for improvement. And they actually got worse as it turned out, but um, so we weren't getting into ceiling effects. Uh -huh. We had that built into uh -huh. study design. And there's no like just regression to the mean issue no, it didn't either. Look like it. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't look like it. I'm just trying yeah. to make sense of what, you know, other reasons for why yeah. some people we are got too. worse. We're, some people, the paper you know. and we're trying to uh, pull all those things in to show that that's not what we think was happening here. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a genuine improvement for them. Interesting. Okay, thanks. I, okay. Yeah. As well, Alice, uh, did you, I may have missed her, did you initially say sustained attention was associated with the right hemisphere? Yes, yes. So, but the left hemisphere folks are performing. Well, LPD, or, or so that's left side, motor, left side, I, so it's right hemisphere. Got yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, the acronym can be, so the symptoms are on the left side, that's what it's, LPD is. Yeah, for. correct, um, correct. So I learned was, long ago to always go with the, the, the thing in front of you, if you're saying left versus right, because I used to work with split brain patients. So I was always doing okay. left and right visual fields, yeah. right? I'm, I, yeah, in the space where I think of stroke, so I think of left hemisphere stroke, so that, that's what I yeah. was confused about. The, the, um, the other thing was the UPDRS, um, I'm not too familiar. So what is the, the, the motor score outcome? Is there, is there like an attentional component. I'm just trying to figure out um, yeah, it's, the outcome. It, really yeah, they'll be doing uh, mostly what we were picking up on was not the tremor part of motor. So this is what you would expect, actually, right? That um, if, if it's about attention, then what can attention control? It can control posture. It can control gait speed. It can control a bunch of things like that. It wouldn't be able to, to do anything for tremor, right? Why, why mm. would attention affect tremor? They can't I mean, they can't willingly reduce their tremor just by thinking about it, but they can sit up straight and they can move their legs in a different way, you know. So uh, the motor score of the UPDRS has a lot of different um, subscales that total up for that. But if you, if you looked within that motor scale, it was really driven by these non-tremor items, which is exactly what we would have expected. Right, okay. okay. But th there's nothing. There's no direct outcome of, of naturalistically paying attention to your motor no. functioning. No, okay. not on the UPD. It's usually given by neurologists. Yeah. Right. So you know they okay. watch them walk. They watch them get up. You know, getting up from chair, doing walk, doing a turn, um, all those various. I think. Things. We'll, yep. Thanks. I, I think. Had, yeah, sorry. I had another question about this sure. sort of the go no go task and how what the dependent measure was. Since we were just talking about this go no go task, these kind of tasks in another meeting, and um, these tasks generally have many more go trials than no go, and mm -hmm. most errors occur on the no go right. trials when people make right. commission errors. They go when they're not supposed to. Yep. Um, and and so um, I wondered how you score, you know, the question is sort of what is being trained here? What aspect, yep. is it they're better at inhibiting when they're supposed to withhold right. on a no go? Okay. Are they better at both? You know, is did you look at D prime by any chance? Yes, we might have be, that. Yeah. yeah, we do have that. I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head on that, but because this because that takes scary. into account, of course, right, whether yep. they're going when they're supposed to, no going when they're yep. supposed to, withholding when yep. you know, it takes into account all four yeah. cells. It's, it's it's all we always look at D prime on these things. Mm -hmm. So so, so when you that. say people improved, it's their D prime improved. 
Um, so on with this, the training. what's improving? It, so there are a couple different things. There's, there are they improving on the training? And the answer is yes, they're improving on the training. That is that they're, um, we can make it harder for them, and they're still getting to criterion, basically. Um, over time. So even though the LPDs never get as high on that as the RPDs, they are definitely making improvements on it. Um, what I'm showing here though is not, this is the post train, this is for the UPDRS and not for the go, no go um, CPT. Right, so um, I didn't yeah. actually show you the CPT results. Um, we have the trajectories for each person um, if I can find that later, I'll pull that slide up. But we've yeah, I guess I'm wondering what aspect of improvement on the task is could be expected to be associated with improvement. You know, sort of stepping back and looking at this a little more theoretically. Though, what yeah. are they getting better at inhibiting? Are they getting better at like tying a, an input to an output, right. knowing when to go and not to? You know, what do you th what do you think is the relationship? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, the interpretation has always been that it's the sustaining of attention, but um, it's not. So, as I said, I'm working on this with Joe DeGutis, and this is really his main thing. Yeah, yeah. So, getting into the weeds on that is something that I probably shouldn't do without rereading that section of the paper that we're working on. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds a little weaselly, but um, you know, I don't want to give you wrong information, but I'm very happy to email you and let you know after I look into that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Or through chat or however you want to do it. Okay. Other questions? Uh, okay. All right. So uh, just doing this summary, this was um, the LPDs were more impaired than RPD at sustaining attention. It was associated with motor symptom severity and the LPDs were more likely to improve following um, training. Uh, important point, I think, is that if we hadn't considered the subgroups, we would have called this a failed trial, that it didn't work, right? But it actually did work for um, a, a, a subset of people. And I think that is very important. So it is providing some support for differential treatment plans based on PD subtype. Okay, so then the last thing I wanna say, having talked about um, all of this uh, with these three studies is what we're doing now. So with the group that I was just working with at EPFL in Switzerland, there are a couple things we're doing. We're using uh, virtual reality environments to induce illusions or hallucinations, whatever you want to call it, by manipulating contrast levels and seeing as people are moving through this VR environment and we're manipulating contrast, when do they start reporting seeing things that actually aren't there? And we'll be doing that with healthy people and with people with PD. Um, we are also continuing our biological motion perception work um, and specifically with presence hallucinations. So the feeling that there's somebody there when there isn't. A lot of people actually experience this. It's not uncommon um, outside of PD as well as within PD. So they have a robotic device to induce presence hallucinations uh, and we're working on that. At BU, we're doing a couple of things on hallucinations. One is we're developing a smartphone app to track them in people with PD who have them pretty often about once a week so that we can um, look at, you know, collect data on a lot of other things to try to predict what's triggering the hallucination for, for that particular person. And then we're starting to look at pareidolia, which is when you see faces um, or other objects in, in meaningless patterns, um, because some people are thinking of this as a proxy for, for hallucinations. So you've seen these kinds of images before, um, you know, many healthy people experience pareidolia. Um, some people experience it a lot more than others and people with PD are among them. And the people with more pareidolia are the ones also who have more hallucinations. So um, we're starting to work on that as well. So this is uh, my group. Um, it, some you've already seen, others you have not and how to reach us if you're interested. Um, I put a star next to vision and cognition um, because we also do all those other things in the lower right hand corner. So it's a very Parkinson centric uh, lab group. Um, and our funders are NINDS, APDA, and uh, Swiss National Science Foundation, NRSA is for Maria Diaz Santos, and Abby Jaywan.
And I thank you for your attention and just wanted to make sure I did a little call out to David Ortiz, who was elected to the Hall of Fame yesterday. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm happy to take questions. I'm also very happy to have you contact me for follow-ups. Yeah, I had a quick one has... if you, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Put up my go head. Ahead. Um, so just on the hallucination, so I understand it correctly, is, is it um, where you're foveating or is it in peripheral vision, if that's um, said correctly? Because I'm just thinking, mm -hmm. Attention is often the assumption is that if you're attending to something, you're looking at it. I'm trying to understand the yeah. So in a... so people with PD, they have both kinds. So it seems to me that uh, you know when I'm talking to people who are you know they're not demented, they're starting to have some problems. It often does seem to be peripheral. Uh, many people will report it um, as they're driving in like at dusk they see something on the side of the road, you know, and that's kind of like the passage hallucination too, feeling like something went by that didn't, or seeing a, a formed hallucination like an animal or a person on the side. And then they say, you know, so they have preserved insight at that point and they turn to look at it and they realize there's nothing there, right? So we wouldn't call it a real hallucination because they have insight into it. Um, as the disease progresses, you see more of the other types where they're looking at something or they're just looking into space and they're reporting seeing something that's not there. So it seems, it does seem to change. I don't think anybody's um, been able to examine it systematically. I mean, the, the problem with uh, studying hallucinations is that you can't catch them in the lab. You know, it, it's one of these uh, ephemeral things. It, very, very rare. I think there's like one fMRI study where they got somebody with halluc to hallucinate while they happen to be in the scanner. But generally speaking, we can't do that. Thank you. Very nice talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the group? I know we interrupted you with some of them. So. Oh, that's okay. I have a, I have a more of a, it's a little bit of a comment. I don't necessarily expect Alice to know, know the answer, but it's um, an interesting observation that I, I, maybe late to the party, but I've just been seeing increasing literature about the association of visual um, deficits, declining vision and, and dementia yeah. um, broadly. Um, so people who need cataract surgery, and I'm mm -hmm. attuned to this because I need it, um, and who don't get cataract surgery are more likely to be demented. And the same has been found with audition as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. so I, I think it's, um, great that you were able to control for dementia severity in your studies, yeah. but brought more broadly, I guess the question is, would you expect that there might be an association in PD between visual impairments and cognitive impairments? Yeah, at the yeah, group definitely. Level? Now, now, part of it is the, the issue of what you're measuring, you know, if you're giving cognitive tests and they can't see them, uh, and it looks like they're worse cognitively than they actually are. And if you cleaned up their visual world, they would actually do better, which is not so different from saying if you get cataract surgery, right? I mean, it cleans up your visual world. You can, you now don't have the problem with the visual input that you had before. Uh, you know, bad input, bad output. So that is part of dementia. Well, the argument in dementia is that the, is that it more broadly, um, is that without that sensory input, that sensory input is critical to maintaining a robust brain and a yep. healthy brain and you yep. start to get atrophy um, that yep. affects your cognitive functioning. So right. that's a sort of a different, but anyway, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I'm gonna be part of a, a conference next month. It's, it's the Rotman conference in Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. the, the main topic is sensory and cognition in Interesting. dementia. So, you know, you might wanna look into that actually. Um, we've been doing it a long time. We've been doing sensory for a long time, visual at least. And um, I find that in some ways people are willing to, to hear that, but neuropsychologists often do not want to hear this because <laughs> it means something about how they're interpreting, you know, and, you know, I've seen this myself. It's not so bad now with the digitals, but, um, you know, if you didn't want to pay for more copies of something, you would just 
Xerox it several times. And every time you did that, it degraded the visual input and you're giving it to people. And, uh, you know, that's why we talk about visual vision fair neuropsychological testing. I mean, you have to bring people up to the same visual level if you want to talk about cognition, I think. Um, but that doesn't mean that cleaning up vision is going to completely fix cognitive problems, obviously not. I mean, we do it with Alzheimer's. We've done the same sort of thing with contrast sensitivity where we bring them up so that they're, they're pretty good, but they're still having problems on a bunch of the cognitive tests, right? So we're certainly not denying that, but we're saying with, with some people, the vision is enough to clean it up. And uh, my colleague of many years, Cleve Gilmore at Case Western, uh, was part of a study on ca removing cataracts in people with Alzheimer's actually. So NIH supported that. Um, you know, there were a lot of people who did not want to do cataract surgery on people with Alzheimer's. They said, what's the point? Which is pretty harsh, right? Uh, but what's the point? And they, you know, he showed that people did better when you took out those cataracts. <laughs> of course they would. You're cleaning things up so that they can actually see and make more sense of the visual world. So, um, so I think that kind of study is very important. Um, you know, we should be doing everything we can. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, we should be doing everything we can to improve quality of life any way we can do it. And if part of that is something simple about the visual world, let's do it because we're not fixing cognition. We're not, we're not, you know, I mean, we're not there yet. So I would rather give them a little something through vision than a lot of nothing. Thank you. Well, on that note, uh, I'm wearing a mask because I'm getting kicked out of my condos conference room. But um, but I wanted to thank Dr. Cronin Golom uh, uh, for her talk, her excellent talk today. Thank you for joining us and accepting our invitation. And thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And, I, and I'll course, thank my former students who talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was brilliant. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.